you said Matthew 16 was the thing that really began to open your your mm-hmm. your eyes to looking at the at scriptures through, through a Catholic lens, and I think that the church fathers would the apostolic fathers would do that as well, certainly. And you mentioned these structures in Matthew 16, so I, I'd be curious to know. Is yeah. that something that you can elaborate on? Is that something that you you saw and maybe wouldn't necessarily say was really compelling anymore because maybe it's, maybe you've learned more since then? Is, is this something that you still think is a really compelling? Oh no, absolutely. This really? has not changed. These are <laughs> I, I I don't know why more Catholic apologists don't use them because these are to my mind totally compelling. Um, in fact, I I'm not uh, you know I I. I I, I am respectful of work that m- many Catholics are doing apologetically. I think sometimes they, I think sometimes, I mean, there's always room for growth and, and constructive criticism. And I think that sometimes the arguments that Catholics use in this area could be improved. Um, now, one of the first things, and I have seen an improvement on this point in the last 30 years. Um, so the the basic argument that is commonly made in Protestant circles, or now I should say, there's not a single view of Matthew 16 in Protestant circles, because there's not a single view of anything in Protestant circles. Even sola scriptura and sola fide are understood different ways by different groups of Protestants. But, so there are Protestants who will say, yeah, Peter's the rock. You know, there are lots of Protestant scholars who will acknowledge that. Um, F.F. Bruce, a Baptist British Baptist scholar, for example, is perfectly happy to acknowledge that, and he's just one of many. But of those in the Protestant community who reject the idea that Peter's the rock, the the key point that they will rely on is in the Greek, um, when Jesus is talking to Peter, he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the word in Greek that he uses for Peter is petros, uh, P-E-T-R-O-S, to use the English alphabet. And then the word he uses for on this rock, the word for rock there is Petra, P-E-T-R-A, to use the uh, English alphabet. And they will say, okay, we've got a difference in these two words. And uh, Petros meant small stone, whereas maybe, you know, like pebble or something, whereas Petra means large rock, like boulder or cliff face or something like that. And therefore, what's happening in this passage is Jesus is using what's, if you want to use a fancy term for it, is called antithetic parallelism. He's put Peter in parallel with the rock, but it's an antithetic parallelism where he's contrasting them. It's like, look how small you are, Peter, compared to this great big other thing I'm going to build my church on. Okay, so that's the standard presentation. Now, Catholics typically will respond to this, uh, apologists will frequently respond to this, with um, a, a number of points. One of them is that, okay, they probably weren't speaking in Greek here. They were probably speaking in Aramaic. And this distinction is probably an artifact of the Greek. In Aramaic, the word that probably would have been used in both cases was kepha, which is, which is where we get Peter's name Cephas. It's a, a Greek form of the Aramaic word kepha, which means rock. And it probably in Aramaic was the same word in both cases. And okay, that's true. And many Protestant scholars are happy to acknowledge that. However, there's a counterargument that I don't see Protestant authors making very often. At least I can't think of any who've done this. But it's what I would do if I was a Protestant scholar or a Protestant apologist. And, and I, I think it would catch a lot of Catholic apologists flat-footed to hear a Protestant apologist say this. But okay, yeah, so maybe it was uh, kepha in both cases in Greek. But the inspired text of Matthew in front of us is in Greek, and the inspired text of Matthew in front of us has two different words here. And so even if it was one word in Aramaic, when the inspired Matthew puts it into Greek, that may indicate the Holy Spirit is drawing out a clarifying uh, qualification here. And so 
the Holy Spirit may be via the medium of Greek clarifying Jesus's meaning to make it more intelligible to a Greek-speaking audience. And so you, Mr. Catholic apologist, can't rely simply on what was in the Aramaic here because it's the Greek that's inspired. And I don't, I, I don't know how most Catholic apologists would respond to that. <laughs> um, I know how I would respond to that. I would say, well, that's a very interesting possibility, but it's not the only one because, number one, if you dig into the linguistics on this, it turns out this small stone, large rock distinction was found in some early Greek poetry centuries before the time of Christ. But if you go to Protestant uh, dictionaries of Greek they will and, and commentators, they will acknowledge that this distinction was gone by the first century. Uh, in first century Koine Greek, uh, these words were synonymous. They didn't have an established difference in meaning. And so you can't rely on, the, on that to show there's a difference. Now, maybe there still is, Maybe there still is a difference between Petra and Petros in this passage, but it's not the words only that tell you that. You have to do more work with the text. So, um, so what else uh, could be going on here? Well, you you noticed I mentioned, and I ha always hate to introduce fancy words when they're not needed. So earlier I mentioned antithetic parallelism. <clears throat> the reason I gave that term was because there's another kind of parallelism we need to know about: synthetic parallelism. Synthetic parallelism occurs, it's a literary form of speech where you have two things, they're in parallel with each other, and they build on each other. So you have the initial introduction of one thing, and then you build on it with something that's in parallel with it, but that is modified. And so even if you want to say Petros means little stone and Petra is meaning large rock, guess what? Doesn't have to be antithetic parallelism, could be synthetic, in which case Jesus is saying, Peter, you may look like a little rock, but on the great big rock that you really are, I'm going to build my church. So even if you grant that these might mean different things, um, they uh, they don't require Peter to be different than the rock. So this is another live possibility. Now, another question that, uh, that Protestants who are uh, probing a Catholic on this passage will frequently do is they will say, well, then if it's, why didn't he, why didn't he use the same word both times if it's Peter? And I will hear Catholics say things like, well, he wouldn't have used Petros both times because uh, he, he wouldn't have used Petra both times because Petra is feminine. It, it's feminine gender in Greek, whereas Petros is masculine. And it would be insulting to Peter to call him Petra. So, of course, he's going to use, you are Peter Petros. He's going to use the masculine form when he directly addresses Peter. Yeah, okay, fine. So what? That's not the issue. Why didn't he use Petros both times? Why didn't he use the masculine form both times? He could have said, you are Petros, and on this Petros, I will build my church. And I, I, I almost never hear Catholic apologists addressing that. <laughs> now, how I would address it is, number one, could be that even though the words don't require a difference in meaning between Petros and Petra, maybe there is, and maybe this is synthetic parallelism. Maybe that's why he changed. Maybe Jesus wanted to make the point, you seem like a smaller stone, but you're, you're more than you think you are, and I'm going to build a church on you. Or maybe it's simply to avoid repetition. Different languages have different tolerances for repetition. English does not like repetition. Hebrew loves it. In Hebrew, you know, you're, you're reading about the construction of the Tower of Babel, and it's like, let us brick with bricks, you know, and like, okay, we would never say that in English. <laughs> you know, let's build with bricks, because we don't like repeating the same word too often in close proximity. So, um, so maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe Jesus is just varying it stylistically, or Matthew is varying it stylistically to avoid too close a repetition of the same word in Greek. So that's a possibility. But here we have a bunch of possibilities. How can we sort them out? That's where the structures come in.
<laughs> because if you look at the structure of this passage, Jesus makes three basic statements to Peter. Now, of course, the setup for the passage, as I'm sure your listeners will be aware, is um, Jesus has said, who do people say that I am? And they propose a bunch of things. Some people think this, some people think that. And Jesus says, okay, so who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in reply to that, Jesus makes three statements. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. This is statement one. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Statement number two. You are, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Statement number three. Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we've got these three statements. Now, statement number one, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Is that something that sounds like a blessing? What do you think? <laughs> um, telling him a name. He's giving him a name. No, 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 no forget no, names. No, 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 no. We're looking at the statements. Blessed okay. are you. Is that a blessing or a put down? That's a blessing. Yeah, that's a blessing. Okay, yeah. let's look at the yeah. third beginning of the third <laughs> statement. I give you the keys to the kingdom. Blessing or put down? That sounds like a blessing. Blessing, right. Okay, yeah. so yeah. that gives us the context for that middle statement, you are Peter. Now, on the antithetic parallelism view, that's a put down. You're this little small stone that's insignificant in contrast to the great big rock I'm going to build my church on. So it doesn't scan to have a blessing followed by a put down followed by a blessing. The context for that middle statement tells us it's a blessing because yeah. we got a blessing before it and a blessing after it. And so that means that you are Peter is not a put down. It is itself a blessing. And that points us in the direction of Peter being the rock, whether you buy the amplification argument or not, he's the rock because Jesus is not putting him down in this passage. Mm -hmm. Then, there, if you notice, each one of these three statements, it itself has three parts. And it's kind of like a little grid. Um, we've covered the first part, but there are two more parts to each one of these statements. So in the first statement, the initial statement is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Then the second part is, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, and the third part is, but my Father in heaven. In the middle statement, we also have three parts. The first part is, uh, uh, you, are, uh, you are Peter. The second part is, on, my, on this rock I will build my church. And the third part is, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In the third statement, the first part is, I give you the keys to the kingdom. The second part is whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And the third part is whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we have a nice three part, three statements with three parts each. Now we've covered the implications of what the first part says about Peter. Maybe we can learn something from looking at the other two parts. So in the first statement, the beginning initial thing, the initial thought is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And that's continued with, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Okay, that tells us why Peter is blessed. He didn't figure this out on his own. God revealed it to him. That's what it means for Peter to be blessed in this case, because he was the recipient of divine revelation. In the third statement, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, that's continued with whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's part of what it means to have the keys. They give you the authority to bind and loose. So we see that in the first statement, the meaning of the initial statement is unpacked in the second two parts. And in the third statement, the meaning of the initial part is unpacked in the second two parts. And therefore, in that middle statement, the meaning of the first part, you are Peter, is going to be unpacked by the second two parts, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so that tells us what the meaning of you are Peter is. You are the one on which I'm going to build this unstoppable, undying church.
<laughs> and you don't need to go to the Greek to see any of that. It's all right there in the English if you're just sensitive to literary form and structure. <laughs> That's fabulous. And I can see, I can see Jimmy why recognizing that in Matthew 16 would would give you pause to say, well, Catholics have something going on here. If this, because mm -hmm. that's quite compelling. 